Uh, our director Felix and his cinematographer Ruben are both uh, Belgian, and they don't really have production designers in uh, in that in that neck of the woods. They use prop stylists and uh, set dressers, and really, uh, at least based on their experience, really use locations and, and modify them through light. So they were really curious about using a production designer and building sets, but they were also really uh, they had a lot of trepidation about it too. They wanted something that looked really naturalistic, but that had a specific style. So Ruben had seen Room and uh, Lemonade, which was something else I did, that had come out within a week of each other. And he made a note in his mind that this was a designer who'd done the, the same, those two projects, but in such an incredibly, you know, with such different results. Yeah. And uh, that intrigued him and it, it's, it lodged in his brain. And then when, when they were looking at designers, he, he brought that up and it was just really serendipitous. I was available and um, and we started talking really a lot about character and naturalism um, in artificial environments. And that ended up becoming actually one of the driving um, creative uh, processes behind our, our, our approach to the movie. Because it's, it's not all shot on location, right? Uh, I would say about 65% of it is built. Uh, the house interior is a build. Yeah. Um, it's very, it, it is very naturalistic. It embraces the landscape. It has enormous windows. It invites light and trees into the interior, but um, but it is not on location. The the home exterior is, yeah. Because it, it is, I think the entire film is very naturalistic, and it, I think when people watch it, it feels very real. So how do you go about achieving that lived inness? You know, there's a there's there's no one answer. To that question, obviously, when you're doing a, a, a project like Room, where uh, you know the, the interior is like the title character of, of the film, um, it, it becomes a character that kind of demands its own approach. You know, it dev demands its own diet, sleep schedule, um, care, and neglect. Um, so uh, you look for clues. You look for clues uh, based on photojournalism, art history, um, documentaries. I try to avoid looking at movies for inspiration, because movies have then looked at those things for inspiration and have then interpreted them. So it would be like uh, trusting the reflection of a mirror through a, a pane of glass. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not gonna be, it's not, it's not gonna be true. Um, in this particular scenario, um, we are making a film about something that happened recently with people who are still alive. Um, so we began the process by me saying on the first day, I, I want to travel up to Inverness, California, Northern California, and, and spend some time with the family. And we sort of played polite detectives for three days. Um, all their stuff. They would go out for a walk, and I'd look at everything I could <laughs> while they were out. Um, and you find uh, clues as to how people live, um, how they remember things, and how they forget things. And that's really interesting when you're constructing an environment that doesn't exist because you're looking to emulate the truth behind a story, but also make it accessible to people who have never met them before instantaneously. And in this particular situation, what I learned was this is a home that encouraged creativity, hyper-liberalism, curiosity, open. extremely open, extremely progressive, very safe. In other words, it's the last place on earth where you'd expect um, a boy to feel shame and to want to escape through drugs. So that became the approach to designing this movie was how to hide secrets in plain sight. And as a result, the home needed to feel very open, very clean, uh, and very one with nature. And there's this one person in this environment that's completely at odds with it. And that's, that's Nick Chef. Mm -hmm. um, the house is Zoe Kravitz's house from Big Little Lies. How did you find it? <laughs> uh, we weren't sure we wanted to shoot there or not when we learned that. But ironically, and this is actually a true story, both on Room and on Beautiful Boy, the homes we ended up choosing were the first homes we saw in the first two hours of scouting. Mm. Um, How many so homes did you see all together? At least 100 on each of those movies. So, you know, that's six or seven weeks of trying to beat the one you saw in the first two hours, and you feel like, you feel like such a moron because you think, well, it can't be the first one we saw. And then for me on the second movie, it's happening again. And I think, am I just, am I lazy? <laughs> am I just commitment phobic? Uh, <laughs> love at first sight. You just, you want the first it just, you know, I think there's a reason for it. We had really good location managers. 
and they had really strong instincts, and that's where they brought us first. And and why not trust them? And we tried to beat it. We tried uh, valiantly to beat it, and uh, and along the way learned that that Big Little Lies had shot there. While we're in prep, Big Little Lies comes out, and there's not a lot of the house in Big Little Lies that we wanted to use, and they decorated it entirely differently. Um, so uh, we we used the kitchen. We modified it very differently than that film um, and, or that TV show, and. Uh, you know, I think it's it's more intriguing to people to know that it's the same house because if they don't look the same than because they recognize it. Mm -hmm. And it's also where Reese with a spoon threw up on the patio. So. Correct. Well, the you you guys reconstructed the second floor, right? That was. We 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 built the the, the home has no second floor, so okay. we we designed a second floor um, that was inspired by the chef home up north. Um, I liked uh, how, like you were saying, like how different Nick's room is because it's dark while the rest of the house is very open. Mm -hmm. So what was your process with his room? As we were making the movie, we learned quickly that every single crew member has someone who is either struggling with addiction, uh, has succumbed to it, or in rare cases has survived it. Um, and. So we saw in our research, going to rehab clinics, uh, watching documentaries, speaking with addicts, how much they like to avoid sunlight. You know, it's, it's when the sun comes up the next morning is when you realize just how far your addiction is gone. Um, so long as it's nighttime, it's still socially acceptable. But that last person who's still going at eight in the morning, three in the afternoon, three days later, that's, you're on a different planet then. Uh, and you start, making choices in your interior design and your, 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 the geography of where you live to avoid that moment of when the sun comes up. So uh, it became a really natural choice for me to gravitate as the film goes on to places with smaller and smaller windows then no windows, uh, basements, corridors, um, uh, bathroom stalls. Uh, these are places that um, where you can stay without being found and where you can go when you don't want to engage. Um, so Nick's bedroom had to sort of, uh, since it's the first interior we see with him, sort of has to predict that a little bit. His walls are a little darker, but they also have both red and blue in them. They're sort of um, bruised colors. They look um, they look like they're harboring discord. Uh, the art on the walls, the newspapers, the things he collects, they're in stark contrast to the organization of the rest of the home. They're sort yeah. of angry. In their assembly, it's like all askew and yeah, not in a not in an unconscious way. It's sort of consciously um, antagonistic. He's at odds with himself. He's at odds with the house. He's at odds with the family, um, and uh, and it, it really starts there visually for him, but then descends into those same colors and that same architecture getting smaller and smaller. He's in smaller and smaller rooms as the movie goes on. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and in contrast, David's office is bright and open and everything is at a right angle. Exactly. Yeah. David's desk was a real character in the movie because I wanted to, I always as a designer want to make people feel the way I feel. And when I met David Chef, who became a very dear friend of mine, he's, he's, he's sort of a natural father figure, but he's a journalist. You feel like you're being interviewed. You feel like you're uh, performing a little bit when you first meet him. You can't help it. He sort of pulls that out of you. The man's been a professional conversationalist for 35 years. Uh, so I wanted his desk to feel like it en it's encircled him and forced you to be on stage. Uh, so his desk is a C-shape. And when uh, Timothy, when Nick, chef, our character, w breaks into the home, he stands behind that desk for the first time, maybe in his life, and he feels, you know, he feels he hasn't earned it. You can see it on his face in the performance. He, he doesn't belong there. Um, I was also struck by all the various rehab centers he goes through in the film, because it starts off in this nice facility, and it kind of evolves into, I think, what is uh, typically portrayed in movies and shows, mm. of just like a, a big room with like rows of chairs and people speaking about their issues and everything. So well, how did you want the rehab centers to mirror his art in the film? Yeah, there's a story there too, and, and part of this comes from personal experience from having a, a very close family member that has struggled with, unfortunately, this particular drug. Um, you go through a process, and the process is, if you're lucky enough to have money and education and resources, your first reaction as a family is, um, oh, this isn't a big deal, we can solve this. This is, he just needs some time. He just needs some time. We'll, we'll, we'll spend some money, not that much, because it's not that serious a problem. 
And so that first home is a Victorian mansion that's falling apart a little bit, but pretty comfortable and very, very temporary. And then if your loved one um, doesn't uh, excel in the rehab process, your next thought is, if you have money, let's throw money at it. You know, let's get the best that money can buy. We can solve this. We have resources. We're smart. Uh, this is a problem. It's a bigger problem than we thought it was. But uh, we will throw money at this. And then you send them to, like, rock star facilities. Uh, and uh, they're really antiseptic and really well designed. And the food is excellent. And there's a lot of celebrities there. And uh, everything's going to be okay. And well, those are 40 grand a month. And when that month or two or three run out, your next thought is, Maybe we shouldn't spend so much money on this. This is going to take longer than I thought. This is going to be a process. And then the places start going down in economy, and they're more frayed, and they're more uh, staid, and the colors are faded, and the, the live, beautiful bonsai trees become uh, plastic Home Depot purchases, um, and there's no art on the walls anymore. And then the final place where we see Nick is a place that is so far down on the ladder of hope and costs so little to go that all the vines are dead. Uh, and that ended up being the poster of the movie and it's a, it's a comment for me on how alive and fertile the landscape is at the beginning of the movie. And although he's still surrounded by uh, life, it's just barely staying alive. a building with those vines. Very much, yeah. It was really important to us that we saw there's hope but very, very little. Um, so what are you working on next? Uh, I'm doing my first uh, sci-fi fantasy film. It's a big budget. It has a big uh, world to create uh, and then fall apart. <laughs> it's uh, sort of a cross between elements of The Truman Show and Inception. And I was just saying earlier, um, you know, when you do these movies, not The Beautiful Boy is a small budget, but when you do a lot of these movies, you're sprinting. And what I'm learning and, and, and really enjoying so far is, uh, is the marathon of this. There's Don't run to finish that task or do that drawing or visit that location. This is a long Iron Man of a, of a journey. And you've got to always be moving, but you should probably keep a very healthy pace. Um, so I'm having a, a great time. 